It is now uh, my pleasure to introduce Sean Boyd, who is our speaker today. Uh, Sean Boyd is the Curator of Archives at History Colorado, uh, here with us in Denver. Uh, Sean has a Master's in Public History from Colorado State University and a Master's in Library Science from Emporia State University. Before coming to History Colorado around two years ago, Sean worked at the Douglas County Libraries for almost 20 years and is from the same hometown as Carrie Chapman Cat. Uh, thank you, Sean, for being here. Thanks so much. Okay, let me figure out how to share my screen and we'll get it started. Everybody see that, I hope. Okay, hi, I am uh, the Curator of Archives at History Colorado, which means that I take care of all the paper-based stuff. Um, I described my job the other day as I take care of the flat things uh, that have a lot of text uh, for the museum. But um, you may have seen some of this presentation online. I recorded it a few months, weeks ago, it, you know, time. In this, in this era doesn't really mean the same thing, but I recorded it a few weeks ago and posted it on YouTube. I have added a, a little bit more um, to this, so if you've already seen that, hopefully you'll, you'll get more out of this. Um, as Mike said, 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which was the largest expansion of voting rights in American history, granting most women the right to vote in all elections. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the conditions that led to Colorado's leading role in the national conversation around suffrage, Colorado's role in that conversation after 1893, uh, up until 1920, some of the collections that we have at History Colorado around suffrage and what activities we are doing to commemorate the anniversary. So, okay. So just as a quick background of the, the women's suffrage movement, we usually start with the Seneca Falls Convention, which um, this is a picture of, uh, you know, a woodcut type picture of, um, and the Declaration of Sentiments. But 1848 is a significant year for that, but also a significant year for Colorado in that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo um, brought Southern Colorado into the United States. So the first people living that, that were not native people that were living in Colorado were brought into Colorado in 1848, or they were here already. Um, so then in 1861, Kansas became a state and they were the first state to allow women to vote in school board elections. And you will notice from the, um, the picture here, the, the square here is Colorado. And so Colorado, parts of Colorado in 1860 were the Nebraska Territory, the Utah Territory, the Kansas Territory, and the New Mexico Territory. The Denver metro area and most of the Front Range was in the Kansas Territory. And Kansas was the first state to allow women to vote in school board elections. Um, and most of the state, well, most of the populated parts of the state were uh, in the Kansas Territory. So then, in 1868, so that was 1861, 1868, the 14th Amendment was passed as part of that post-Civil War Reconstruction era. And it said all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So this started to present some interesting um, situations for women as um, I would read that as women are citizens of the United States, all persons born or naturalized in the United States, and citizens can vote uh, for the other amendments. So a couple of women, including um, Victoria Woodhull, run, ran for president in that era, and um, some women were arrested trying to vote. Um, there was um, some court cases that determined, no, women don't actually get to vote. But in 1869, women in the Wyoming Territory were granted suffrage by the state constitution. So Wyoming beats us as the first state where women could vote, but it was because they wrote it into the state constitution. Ours was by the popular vote of the voters. Okay, so then in 1876, uh, Colorado's constitution is written and suffrage was actually part of the discussion, women's suffrage was part of the discussion, a lot of suffrage was part of the discussion of the Colorado Constitution, but women specifically 
were called out in the Colorado Constitution. And um, a couple of the leaders in that um, convention that were pushing for suffrage included Edward McCook, uh, Henry Bromwell, which the picture on the lower uh, left, right down here, is Henry Bromwell, and Ajapita V. Hill, uh, who was from Southern Colorado. He was a strong supporter of women's suffrage as well. Um, and they did not include it in the state constitution because it was the third or fourth time they had submitted the state constitution and it had been rejected the previous times and they didn't want to do anything that they felt was risky uh, or contentious. Um, but they did write into the state constitution that um, I think this, the statement says all people not, um, not enfranchised at present can be added at a later date by a simple majority of the populace polled. So that got the suffrage leaders in, in Colorado, which we have the ledger book from the first um, suffrage societies in Colorado, and they were in 1876. 1877, um, Dr. Elida Avery was the first president of those groups. Um, so they organized a campaign in 1877, uh, just based on, <laughs> they perceived that the, that the legislature that had been formed with the constitution and the, the constitutional convention and the territorial legislature had been somewhat supportive of women's suffrage. So I think they thought they were gonna be able to push it through in the whole state. Um, Susan B. Anthony, who's in the upper right-hand corner there, came out, and that picture is actually from about 1877, so that's the age she would have looked. Um, you know, she's always portrayed as an old lady, and, you know, she was older in 1877, but she's not super old. Um, we have several letters from Susan B. Anthony in our collection, and one of them says, well, now I'm everybody's grandma. Uh, anyway, she came out here and she barnstormed through several mining communities. Um, and then Lucy Stone, who's, who's there in the, the other picture, she also was a, came out here with her husband and they, and they were big supporters. Other early supporters from Colorado included John Evans and William Byers, who the Byers Evans house um, was named for. Um, William Byers built the house and his son, uh, or the son of John Evans moved into it. So the Evans family lived there. And uh, Nathan Meeker, he was also one of the early members. Um, Greeley was kind of a hotbed of populism at that point, or progressivism. Uh, it was soundly defeated. Uh, there was one county where only five people voted for it. And you can guess which counties in Colorado, if you know Colorado politics and geography at all, it only passed in one county, and that county was Boulder. So that was the 1877 campaign. They continued to meet, they continued to talk about it, but um, our suffrage association pretty much, the, the ledger book ends in about 1881 and they kept bringing it up, but there wasn't a whole lot more that they could do at that point. So then 1893 is when things kind of pick up around here. Um, and 1893 is an interesting year because the World's Fair was happening in Chicago, which um, if you've read Double in the White City or uh, I actually watched a, a film about the 1893 World's Fair on Amazon Prime narrated by um, uh, Willy Wonka, the guy that played Willy Wonka. Anyway, the World's Fair was like this major event in the United States. The, this picture right here is the campus, part of the campus of the World's Fair. And a lot of the people that went to the World's Fair from Colorado, particularly the women um, that went, were also in support of suffrage. And there was a women's building at the, at the World's Fair, but it wasn't entirely devoted to suffrage. It was, you know, all women doing all things. Um, so we do have some letters in our collection that are, that are like, why aren't they giving Susan B. Anthony more floor time at the World's Fair? But anyway, a bunch of our suffrage leaders, um, including Alice Meredith, who I'm gonna talk about later, went to Susan B. Anthony, who was there at the World's Fair and talked to her and they said, well, we think we can get this through this time. We think we can get the campaign going. 
So this is like in May of 1893. And um, Mrs. Anthony was not optimistic about uh, the chance of Colorado successfully pushing this through. She didn't want to devote the, the energies of the National American Women's Suffrage Association to a losing cause. And she basically said she was too old. And, but she sent her young friend, Carrie Chapman Cat, who's right here, um, instead and said, well, you know, she's, she's sort of young and new, so send her out and maybe she can, she can help. Um, and we have like letters from Mrs. Cat uh, talking about her pay because the Suffrage Association in Colorado paid her um, speaking fees and her lodging and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so Carrie came out probably in about July, June or July, I think, of 1893 and started talking all over the state. Um, they didn't really talk about why they thought it would pass, uh, but they, they had built this network of women's organizations throughout the state. Women's clubs were starting. Uh, of course, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was, was up and running by then. So there, were, there was sort of a women's network of, of the beginnings of political action happening. Um, and then the other big thing that happens in Colorado in 1893 was there was a silver crash, which is a picture up here, just kind of demonstrating what that is. Um, essentially, the U.S. economy had been based on, um, well, this was when they decided to base it on gold. So it caused Colorado's economy to collapse because the mining interests were really heavily invested in silver. And so economic recession, um, something we have been familiar with, uh, caused people to think, well, maybe we'll try something different. You know, maybe, maybe that'll, uh, maybe letting more women vote will help. I should say part of that 1876, going back to 1876, part of the um, discussion around the Constitutional Convention was if you count women as part of the population, as part of the voting population, it helped us have enough people to become a state. Because, for example, in 1865, when Colorado was rejected as a state, one of the reasons they stated was because there weren't enough people. Um, so then in 1893, they started their, their campaign. And the newspaper articles really kind of start taking off in about September. So elections the first week of November. I mean, I feel like we're in a constant state of elections now. But really, this campaign was was really focused September through the first week of November of 1893. And one of the suffrage leaders, Alice Meredith, who I'm gonna talk about, um, basically said they slipped it in under the radar before anybody noticed um, was part of their strategy. Uh, the main opponents to the 1893 campaign were the Brewers Association, who at one point put up anti-suffrage posters in Denver um, and people came and took them down. Um, but even they didn't get very organized. So that was the 1893 campaign. And they, and they were successful. It, it passed by 55%. Okay, wait, before I get into that, I just want to point out this picture here. So this is, this is out of a magazine, but this is one of our main um, suffrage pictures that we use in Colorado a lot. And um, it's kind of funny because I, I do believe this is the 1893 election day. And I found a newspaper clipping saying that women were campaigning too close to the polling place because the same rules that apply now of like no electioneering within, I think it's 500 feet of the door of the polling place um, can happen. And the newspaper was commenting that these women didn't know what they were doing. And so they were haranguing people up to the door, which is good for them. <laughs> so, okay. So the result, uh, it was organized by the Colorado Nonpartisan Equal Suffrage Association, which, you know, not the trippiest off the tongue. Uh, they got a lot of support from churches and other women's organizations. 55% uh, of the electorate turned out to vote, which is pretty low given uh, Colorado's current voting numbers, but uh, there were 35,798 voting for and 29,000 and change voting against. Uh, again, very popular in Boulder, um, not as popular in Southern Colorado, uh, passed in Greeley, um, 
what I found really interesting reading, if you can read the Colorado newspapers for free on coloradohistoricnewspapers.org. And um, the newspaper in Leadville was not really supportive. Um, it, it, the tone of those articles versus the tone of the articles in Greeley are really telling. Um, in Greeley, it was like, yes, this is obvious. We should vote for this. The, the paper in Leadville was more like, well, we don't know. It's experimental. This could be risky. Um, and Leadville did not, I don't think Leadville voted for it. I think it was one of the counties that, that was not a supporter. So, you know, Colorado's got a lot of different, in 1893, they had a lot of different um, demographics and different voting blocks. And some of them were more supportive of suffrage than others. So in that next election in 1894, there were three women who were elected to the state, um, state legislature. Uh, Clara Cressingham, who's up here. Um, Carrie Clyde Holly, which is this one, and Frances Clock. Uh, they became the first women to be elected to any legislature in US history uh, when they were elected to the House of Representatives. Uh, Claire Cressingham was 32 years old and she was the youngest of the three. Um, Cressingham also became the first woman, woman to fill a leadership position. She was the secretary of the House Republican Caucus and to have a bill she introduced become law, which boosted the state's budding sugar beet industry. Another bill she introduced addressed the creation of a system of free schools. Um, Carrie Clyde Holly uh, was the only one of the three who'd been active in the suffrage movement. And one of her bills, which was the first one sponsored by a woman, raised the age of consent uh, to be married from 16 to 18. Uh, it did eventually pass. She originally wanted it to be 21, uh, but they, it had been 16 and they, they talked it up to 18 as a compromise. She also helped pass a bill giving mothers the same rights to their children as fathers. And with other women, she passed a bill to create homes for delinquent girls. The third woman was Frances Clock. Uh, who was the first woman to chair a committee. Uh, she, she chaired the Indian and Veteran Affairs Committee and to preside over the state legislature. Clock protested some of the norms of the House, including offensive language, uh, which was used on the floor during debate, lobbyists on the floor, and smoking in the chamber. She introduced legislation establishing a constitutional amendment for suffrage and elections. So she was trying to push for um, national suffrage in 1894 um, and passing the constitutional amendment. Okay, so then I keep treating this like it's PowerPoint, but it is uh, Google. All right, uh, so then after this election, this, this painting is called a painting, it's a, it's a um, newspaper magazine clipping, it's called The Awakening and uh, after suffrage wins in Wyoming, Colorado, Washington, California, and Oregon were followed by hard fought victories in Arizona and Kansas, Nevada, and Montana. By the end of 1914, more than 4 million women had voting rights equal to men in 11 states, all in the West, leaving women elsewhere still reaching for the light of liberty's torch of freedom. Henry Mayer's 1915 illustration was the centerfold of a special suffrage issue of Puck Magazine guest edited by New York State suffrage groups. And that's the caption if you get to go to the Library of Congress's suffrage exhibit. Um, but we're not traveling, so I'm bringing you the, the, the caption here. Um, after 1893, but before 1920, Colorado suffrage leaders were called upon the national stage. Uh, some of them really called. Um, let me see. Oh. Okay, so this letter is from Susan B. Anthony. And let's see, this is a letter to Henry Teller. This is in his, he, his manuscript collection. And on this, it says, dear friend, this is the 18, right after the 1894 election. And she's talking about in the typed section, she's talking about how they're going to have the National American Woman Suffrage Association annual meeting. And she wants him and his wife to be on the platform. Um, and then at the bottom, and it says, hoping Mrs. Teller and all the family are well, I am yours sincerely, Susan B. Anthony. All of Susan B. Anthony's letters are signed yours sincerely, by the way. 
Um, and then it says, P.S. And say to Mrs. Teller that we shall want her to sit on the platform that evening without fail. <laughs> and, you know, and U.S. Senior Senator, please tell me if there are any other Colorado friends. But whenever I've introduced this letter to people, I've said, when Susan B. Anthony tells you to get on the stage without fail, you, you get on that stage. Um, but not all political figures in Colorado were supportive. Um, so, but they would be asked about suffrage if they were speaking outside of the state on political matters. So uh, former governor of Colorado, Henry Bucktell, um, you would have thought when he spoke to a group in New York on July 19th, 1909, that it wouldn't get back to Colorado that quickly. Uh, but boy, did it. Uh, this headline is from July uh, 20th. So he spoke on July 19th. By July 20th, here is this article, Bucktell Opposes Women's Suffrage. And he says, only the dregs of womankind vote in Colorado. The mothers have to be practically clubbed to the polls. He continued by saying, my wife and daughter shun politics, as do the majority of the women in Colorado. Um, but, okay, so this is July 20th that this article appears in the Denver Post. Subsequent articles in the Post included an interview with his daughter uh, in July 21st, so the next day, that said, my mother and I vote. We have not missed an election since we had the right to vote. My father insists upon both my mother and myself going to the polls and casting our votes. So the, the press made a, made a field day of, oh, he's coming back. He's going to have to talk at home. Um, and there was a lot of he's being called on the carpet by statewide suffrage leaders. Um, but what was cool about this period is that it, it helped uh, a lot of the women in Colorado become national suffrage leaders. And um, I'm going to move on to talk about Ellis Meredith, but if you have questions about what I just talked about, I'm going to kind of shift. So we want to make sure that if you get your questions in about the timeline, feel free to put those in. Um, Ellis Meredith was known as the Susan B. Anthony of Colorado. Um, I should have also mentioned before I get to Ellis that one of the main leaders in Colorado um, during that 1893 campaign was a, a woman named Elizabeth Ensley, who was African American. So the Nonpartisan Equal Suffrage Association was integrated. Um, Ensley went on to form the Colored Women's Club of the United States. So she was um, definitely also set to become a national leader, just not. Um, necessarily in Colorado. I think she moved away eventually. Maybe not. I don't remember. Sorry. Uh, Ellis. Okay. Ellis was born in 1865 in Montana, um, but her family had been in the West since at least 1857. Um, one of the collections we have from her is um, that we just got, uh, which I'm going to talk about, uh, shows some stuff from her family in Minnesota in 1857. Uh, which is really interesting because, like, I don't think of Minnesota as the frontier, but it clearly was. Um, she was a reporter um, for and a columnist for the Rocky Mountain News, which was our one of our two main newspapers during the suffrage campaign in 1893. It helped that her dad was the managing editor, but she went on to an illustrious writing career after that. Uh, she was corresponding with people on behalf of the Nonpartisan Equal Suffrage Association with national suffrage leaders. And after the suffrage movement, she worked on the charter for the city and county of Denver and was also, <coughs> excuse me, very involved in the Federation of Women's Clubs. She also worked for uh, the Nonpartisan Equal Suffrage Association, but not, sorry, the NASA, National Women's Suffrage Association in um, 1916 and for the National Democratic Party. Uh, she got married a couple of times, like Carrie Chapman Cat. So sometimes she's referred to as Mrs. Stansberry, sometimes she's Mrs. Clement, um, but she always wrote as Elizabeth Meredith, or I'm sorry, her real name was Elizabeth Meredith. She always wrote as Ellis Meredith. It's like her pen name, like Mark Twain. So we have two collections from Ellis. The older one was donated in 1925 by her. She brought it to the museum, uh, which was the State Historical and Natural Society at that point. 
and it includes letters from national suffrage leaders about the 1893 campaign, uh, as well as a lot of literature about the 1893 campaign. Uh, we've digitized much of the collection and are in the process of a crowdsourcing campaign, which I will talk about later, uh, to translate the letters from handwriting for a new generation, because we find that a lot of people who can read 1893 handwriting may not have good um, digital skills, and the people who possibly have good digital skills may not be able to read the handwriting. Um, this collection contains incredibly valuable information about the suffrage campaigns, including Carrie Chapman Cat's pay negotiations for speaking engagements, as well as Susan B. Anthony's congratulation letter uh, to the Colorado suffragists. So if you look at the letter on the right-hand side here, this is the letter from Susan B. Anthony that uh, I didn't know we had when we started this whole process. Um, and thanks to some other members of the Center for Colorado Women's History Board, they were like, uh, yeah, you have lots of Susan B. Anthony letters. But I, it wasn't coming up on, in my digital searching because it was SBA2EM. Like, why would I think to look that? Anyway, so this says Philadelphia, sorry, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, November 27th, 1893. Uh, my dear Mrs. Stansberry, and Ellis has typed Ellis Meredith on the top of it, which I think is super charming. Um, this letter is actually four pages long, and uh, Mrs. Uh, Anthony's handwriting, Miss Anthony's handwriting is uh, kind of hard to read. She was a busy lady. She was writing really fast. But what's cool here is, oh, how glad I am that at last we have knocked down our first state by the popular vote with two exclamation marks. It might as well have a smiley face on it as far as I'm concerned. Um, so this is, this is now on exhibit in our uh, What's Your Story exhibit at the museum and it's going to move into an exhibit in September called American Democracy once we can get the museum open again. Um, another letter out of this Alice Meredith collection is from Lucy Stone who on the back of another one of, there's two letters from Lucy Stone in this collection, and on the back of the other one, there's a note from Ellis that said that Lucy and her husband, uh, Henry Blackwell, were the largest financial contributors to the 1893 campaign. So that's kind of sweet. And then this is a Carrie Chapman Cat letter. So these are just some examples of some of the uh, correspondence in that um, collection and that's been available since 1925 in the museum and would still be available if you were able to come in you can ask for this to be brought out um, but we are putting it online as well okay also in this collection is Ellis's um, lifetime membership in the National American Women's Suffrage Association which is signed by Susan B Anthony Carrie Chapman Catt and Harriet Taylor Upton um, and as well as uh, pro-suffrage literature that, that she collected. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, magazines and newspapers that highlight different uh, suffragists from throughout Colorado. Um, Denver Public Library has Martha Conine's scrapbook, um, which, which they've got uh, available when we can do research. Um, Mary C.C. Bradford was the uh, head of the, the public school. She was the superintendent of public instruction for the state and Sarah Platt Decker was another um, leader in the state. So then we have a new Ellis Meredith collection that showed up last year. Uh, it was kind of a fun conversation. These, I, I don't get a lot of phone calls at my desk but and the ones I do get about donations are not always the funnest for me to answer because I have to say no a lot. But this person called and she said, so I was Googling and I found the name Alice Meredith in your collection. And I said, yeah, she's a, she's a big suffrage leader in Colorado. And they said they, this couple bought a house in Florida and there was a set of papers in there. And uh, they asked the person that they bought the house from and he said he found them on a houseboat. So these papers were found on a houseboat in Florida. I don't quite know how they ended up in Florida because Ellis died in Washington, D.C., as far as I know, in 1955, and her husband died in 1965. They didn't have any children. So who knows? Maybe they owned a boat. Maybe somebody took it to Florida. But it is a treasure trove. Um, it covers more of the post-1893 story 
Um, it has lots of photos of Alice's family. Most of them are her husband's family, but there are friends of hers from Colorado in there. Talks about her writing career and there's more correspondence. So these are some of the, some of the signatures that are in this, this new collection um, and headers. So WCTU, Ida Husted Harper, um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Carrie Chapman Cat. Again, this Carrie Chapman Cat letter in this collection is amazing because it's in, that's not a clip from it, but the Carrie Chapman Cat letter is from 1915 and it's a four page letter and while Susan B. Anthony's letter to Colorado was, I'm sorry, I can't come to your party because I'm too old. <laughs> Carrie's is, why aren't you asking me to your party? Um, but I, this is the address I would have given if I was allowed to come. And she talks about Colorado's um, role that the anti-suffragists were using Colorado. Um, because during that 1893 to 1920 period, we had a lot of labor strife in Colorado. And the anti-suffrage movement was blaming the women for that, which is not necessarily applicable, but that was, that was Carrie's argument. Um, there's another Susan B. Anthony letter in here. There's Anna Howard Shaw. And I got really excited about Ben Lindsay because um, Ben Lindsay's a Colorado um, progressive leader. He, he basically invented juvenile courts uh, for the whole United States. And there's a telegram in here where he was running for, um, he was at the National Progressive Party Convention in 1912. And he sent a telegram asking Alice if she could write a supporting article in the Denver Post um, and if he should run for vice president with uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And she wrote back, article's fine, I can do that, but uh, tell Teddy, that uh, you will not run against William Jennings Bryan. And so, I mean, I think that that's interesting because they're asking her for her opinion in 1912 when women all over the country could not vote. But here's a woman from Colorado who is being asked about her opinion on national politics. Uh, Ellis was also on the committee for the first charter convention for the city and county of Denver, and it includes the, the charter. It's a little booklet that's about that big. Um, this is in 1902, and the, I love this Denver Post clipping. Um, I don't know that Ellis was super short, but they, they made her look really short in the political cartoon. Uh, and the caption for this one says, take off your, oops, sorry. Take off your hats for a real vote getter, you punters, uh, pikers, sorry. And uh, she's got more votes than all the men. So she was the first one elected to the, the charter committee. Okay, so then these are some more highlights in that collection. Um, she went on to work for the Democratic Party. So there's a lot of pro Woodrow Wilson literature in here uh, from the 1916 election, which is really interesting because the National American Women's Suffrage Association was not in support of um, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, she also collected um, sort of um, National Women's Party literature. She was working for uh, the National American Women's Suffrage Association. The National Women's Party was the more radical of the two, and uh, they were opposing Woodrow Wilson. So she, yeah, so she collected the opposition literature, including this campaign textbook over here, lays out the entire strategy of the National Women's Party in 1916. It's awesome. It has lots of good data. She also talks about her writing career. She was very proud. She saved all of her union uh, newspaper union things and her uh, receipts for getting paid for publishing five novels that she wrote. So she saved her um, her pay stubs. Uh, there's also a bunch of magazines in there that are articles that she wrote or that featured her. So lots more support stuff. There are a lot of other women's suffrage collections at History Colorado. Ellis's is the most like robust but um, this is a picture of Governor Shoup signing the 19th Amendment. Uh, we also last year got anonymously in the mail an original 1893 ballot, which we didn't have. Um, I kind of made the joke that I'm like manifesting things because I said, you know what, we really need an 1893 ballot. And then like two weeks later, it showed up in the mail. And then I said, you know what, I also need a million dollars. That has not shown up. Um, 
And then this letter over here is another Susan B. Anthony letter that was kind of hidden. It's to a Colorado suffragist named Grace S.B. Patton. And it kind of talks about the um, suffrage movement in Hawaii, of all things, because Grace was about to move to Hawaii and Susan B. Anthony was like, well, if you're moving to Hawaii, here's what you need to talk about for the Suffrage Association. So I just love that that was, that was her effort uh, all over the country. So how can you get to these? The Stephen Hart Research Center on the second floor at the History Colorado Center in downtown Denver is open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4 when the museum's open. Um, so stay tuned for that, but you can access any of these collections when the museum is open. Uh, History Colorado is also doing several other things around the women's suffrage movement. Um, I know these URLs are not like super intuitive, uh, but we have the Women's Centennial Vote Commission where History Colorado has kind of become this, the, the focus for the state um, for uh, women's suffrage activities, commemoration activities. So this first link gives you uh, kind of a calendar of events and some other things. They're also active on Facebook. Um, the women's, uh, the Ellis Meredith collection, this is the link to start doing transcriptions. We, we launched it last week. So you can uh, get on there and type out what the words say. Um, and that's just the first of many that we're gonna be doing. We also have uh, at the Center for Colorado Women's History, there's currently an exhibit about women's suffrage once they get to be open again. And we have an American democracy exhibit coming from the Smithsonian, which will be opening in September. It's gonna feature that 1893 ballot uh, pretty heavily. There's also a, a section from um, the Smithsonian about women's suffrage. And then I am working on a guide to all of History Colorado's women's suffrage collections. Um, so I've got a list that's 75 pages long at this point of people that I'm researching that were involved in the suffrage movement. So with that, I hope I didn't go too far over time, uh, but we'll leave some time for questions and I'm going to see if Mike wants to get on here or Kat and moderate this thing. All right. So thank you, Sean. That was awesome. So we do have a few questions here. Um, and if anyone else that has a question, uh, please do put it in the Zoom chat box and we'll get that on my document so we can see uh, what we have here. So there are a couple of things here. Uh, one was a question on, would you be able to discuss the various political groups which aligned with the Colorado suffrage movement and why? Sure. Um, it wasn't a strict political party thing. Um, and the, the political parties in the United States uh, sort of shifted after uh, FDR. So the Republicans were the more liberal party, uh, liberal in air quotes. Um, but uh, the, the national, by the 1920 election, the National Women's Party was, was pretty aligned with the Progressive Party and the, and the Republicans. Um, but in Colorado, it seemed to be the populist party was the main um, political party that that aligned the most, but all of the parties benefited from women joining them. Uh, we have at the at the museum one of the artifacts that I bring out a lot for women's suffrage is the nineteen or no eighteen ninety four Republican State Convention has a a woman in the biography section and they talk up um, women being involved in their movement. But it was it was all the all the political movements, maybe the Democrats were slightly less supportive in the, um, in the 1893 election, but there were definitely Democratic women involved in that movement in 1893 as well, because I'm finding it across the political spectrum. Awesome. Um, sorry, my slide went up here. So another Progressive question. Party also, yes, I should point that out. It was also the, the, the Populist Party and the Progressive Party and the Democrats and the Republicans, you know, like the Bull Moose Party is in there as well. So. <laughs> awesome. All right. And then another question I have here um, was, do you have any information about Theodosia Ammons and the Colorado suffrage movement? Oh, absolutely. Theodosia Ammons was um, one of the corresponding secretaries of the the women's suffrage movement. I think she died in like 1908. I don't remember. She died fairly young, but she was um, 
best friends with Eliza Rout, who was the governor's wife and is often credited with being the first woman to vote in that 1893 election, or 1894 election, the one where women could actually vote. Awesome. So yeah, the, I, I have a whole talk about Theodosia Ammons that I've done. Well, I'll keep that in mind as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, looks like some questions are coming in here. Also some people making notes. I guess if we had a question, it's uh, Susan had said that Carrie may have been a member of the Progressive Party. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then we have a kind of a note here. Uh, Judy Gone had read somewhere that Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were in Colorado in June of 1872. Do you know anything about that and if there's any evidence? I haven't looked that far back, but um, yeah, entirely possible. I mean, I know Susan B. Anthony had a pretty strong connection to Colorado um, because they really did um, think that the West, well, it started to emerge once Wyoming kind of, kind of um, had women's suffrage, it emerged that the Western states might be a little more open to suffrage. Um, you know, Utah signed it pretty early, most of the, the Western states. Um, I wanted to point out, I see one about Alice Paul. So Alice Paul was the head of the National Women's Party. Um, and they were the ones who were kind of in opposition to, not opposition to, but they were, they wanted the cause of suffrage to be the front and center part of the 1918 um, election. And so they, their platform that I was, that I was pointing out um, in 1916 was not at all supportive of Democratic candidates in any way. And um, they actually had their, their uh, national meeting of the National Women's Party it was in Colorado Springs in 1916. Um, and Alice Paul was one of the speakers. Uh, one of the little weird clips that I found was that Alice Meredith was part of the committee that went to President Woodrow Wilson and got him to sign a pro suffrage statement. And about two hours later, Alice Paul was burning it in front of the White House in protest. So, you know, there wasn't, by, by uh, once it had become a mature political movement, there were many voices within that movement. So. Um, but some notes from earlier, let's see. Um, Rebecca Hunt did want to mention that she believes Kentucky gave their women the right to vote in school elections in the 1830s, and then women were voting in town elections in 1887. Thought that was interesting. Um, but then another uh, question I have on here. Can you discuss how History Colorado is tackling interpretation of association between women's suffrage in Colorado and the uh, U.S. and anti-immigrant nativism? Hmm. Um, admittedly, I've been more focused on racism in the suffrage movement. Uh, I, I don't have a good answer for that. We're, we're definitely looking at, like my guide, I'm trying to find anybody who is not a white lady. Or, or a white man. Um, I'm, I'm very much highlighting that stuff. Um, I don't know about the nativist thing. I, I do know when I first got to History Colorado, um, and this isn't anybody's fault, it just, it's just how like catalogs, museum catalogs and library catalogs emerge. But when you typed in suffragette, you got quite a few things in our catalog. When you typed in suffragist, you only got one record, and it was this woman named Minnie C.T. Love, who um, I, I studied a lot when I was in Douglas County. She was this uh, progressive doctor who helped start Children's Hospital and um, did, did a lot of great stuff. But then she became the head of the Women's Auxiliary of the Klan. So maybe let's not use her as our centerpiece for uh, talking about women's suffrage in Colorado. Uh, her son, Charles Waldo Love, who um, uh, was a famous Colorado artist, um, didn't agree with his mom's political uh, affiliations around the Klan and, and all of that. Um, and he painted the, the painting that you often see of Baby Doe Tabor, as well as a bunch of the um, dioramas at the Museum of Nature and Science. Those were Minnie loves son's paintings. But yeah, Minnie, Minnie's a complicated suffrage figure. And uh, I think she's the most anti, I mean, she's the most nativist um, 
in that in that anti-immigrant sense um, person that I can that I can think of. And you know, all we can do at this point is just talk about that story and talk about the fact that um, sometimes the progressive movement went a little over the cliff. So, awesome. Thank you, Sean. And then I do have another question that's specific to Grace F.C. Patton. Uh, do you know what year uh, she was moving to Hawaii? Yeah, let me go back to my thing here. Uh, looks like 1899. Awesome. So, um, and then let's see here. Now there's a person that was thinking of the anti-alcohol um, groups in Colorado and wondering if they ever uh, aligned with the Grange party or the Grange. I haven't found a lot about the Grange and the suffrage movement. Um, I don't, they, they haven't come up in, in my research. Now, like Rebecca's on here, so maybe um, she can say something. I, I, yeah, Rebecca points out that Minnie Love graduated from Howard University, which is a historically black college, which is part of her whole complicated, why are you running the Klan story. Um, the Grange, I don't, I don't know. I know there were women of the Grange. Um, there, there were women who were like the president of the Grange later on. So I don't know what their, what their affiliation with the suffrage movement was. Awesome. Well, maybe we have this. Like, uh, might you have any info or could direct someone to Alvina Washburn from Loveland who was able to vote in the 1870s? Do you know anything about Alvina? Sorry, give me, give me that back. Or what? The Alvina Ma Washburn? Washburn. Washburn. Let me see if she's on my suffrage list and if I have anything <laughs> about her. Hang on just a moment. Uh, let me get into my list. And uh, yeah, I should have just had this up and ready to go just in case. Um, but I didn't. So go ahead and ask me another question and I'll try to find sure, that. Sure. Uh, looks like we'll be connecting you to some people. So if there are some requests, um, please get a hold of me via my email, uh, but we'll have this chat to refer to as well. Um, but there, while she's looking, there are just a couple of notes that people have been submitting, and I love that we can share this stuff with each other. Um, Rebecca tells us that Judy Gahn has been doing some good work on Francis, Francis Clock, and how she found that clock was in the American Protective Association, um, a precursor of the KKK. Um, mm -hmm. Susan mentioned, uh, Woodrow Wilson changed his position after the suffrage campaign was suspended during World War I to help the war effort. When I wonder if that was Ellis's doing. I just, wonder, right? She was working in that era. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> oh no, let me just finish that thought here. Uh, when he saw how helpful and committed they were, he decided to come on board probably for political reasons to gain the women as supporters of his campaign. Carrie then became supportive of him and the League of Nations. Um, so what I have about um, Mrs. A.L. Washburn is that she was a member of the Territorial Women's Suffrage Society. Um, she is mentioned in the, uh, so she's mentioned in the 1876 campaign as well as the 1877 campaign and the 1893 campaign. And she was the corresponding secretary of the Colorado Women's Suffrage Association in 1876. So she's definitely a big figure. I haven't gotten to the W's yet of my list, to be honest. <laughs> so yeah, that list she'll, be, is huge. she'll be somebody I write a thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll take a couple more questions. Um, and then if there are any other questions or specific people that you know, you know about or would like to hear uh, what we might have resources for, send me an email and we'll do our best to uh, connect you with any resources we might have. Um, but uh, one question, yeah. Yeah, uh, I just noticed, um, Gage, I don't think Victoria Woodhull ever came to Colorado. Uh, I just love her in her story. <laughs> she ended up in London, so um, I just I just like to slip Victoria Woodhull in whenever possible. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then, so just two more questions here. Well, from Meredith, we have, how are you maintaining quality with the crowdsourcing translation, in quotes? I might need more clarification on this unless you know. Um, I think we're having at least two or three people every, uh, or, you know, transcribe everything. Um, and then before those transcriptions, um, which we haven't completed, I mean, this is kind of an experiment. So we haven't gotten the results yet, but before we post the results publicly anywhere, which they'll, they'll end up in our catalog, 
so that these articles are more, these letters are more keyword searchable. Um, before those get posted, we'll read them to, to vet them for sure. So, and then Carolyn says that her organization has a women's book club. Uh, she would be interested to know if you have any recommendations for uh, readings on women's suffrage. Um, I, you know, I, I don't. I have read a lot of um, books on Carrie Chapman Cat because I just love it. Um, most of the stuff about, and, and maybe Rebecca chime in here, um, most of the stuff that I have read about Colorado women's suffrage have been articles. Uh, many of them in Colorado Magazine, Colorado Heritage, which are uh, History of Colorado publications. Um, let me find, I'm just going to do a quick women's suffrage books sure. and see if anything comes up that I recognize. Awesome. <laughs> so. And then if you have any recommendations, Sean, I do send out a follow up email. Okay, good. Um, so we'll get a list together. And also, if you have any suggestions, I see a couple in the chat. I did read uh, why they marched. I will put those in those as well, as well as the Women's Hour. Uh, we yep. have a book club with the Center for Colorado Women's History that had both those titles um, already read. So yeah, please do put any book recommendations or any thoughts in the chat. I will sift through that and share any pertinent information with you all in the follow-up email. Um, but thank you so much, Sean. Uh, any final thoughts before we uh, put it on to the closing statements? No, I'm so excited to uh, be able to talk to people and thanks for listening. And this gives me an outlet for my endless research that I'm doing in the newspapers. Awesome. Well, thank you so much.